The Book of Recollections, Episode 12, Knowledge is Golden, by Dysylvania. Welcome, welcome to the end of the world. And look how far our royal frog and its moody bodyguard have gotten. Curious to know what comes next? Let me, your one and only book of recollections, guide you through this journey. But first, make sure you are up to date with all the threads of this complex plot, because once we start venturing into today's events, there's no going back. I'm kidding, silly. Maybe? Anyway, let's begin. Six hectic hours had passed since the trials began, and while others resented the chaotic course of their path, Shaklashak followed the calming flow of the Sabbath River. Further down the river, a strange figure stood still, awaiting. Its raggedy clothes were blowing in the wind. The figure seemed so thin that it was a miracle the gusts of wind didn't knock it off its feet. But what alarmed Shaq the most was the lack of hair. Nothing on its head, nothing on its face, no hair at all, anywhere. He approached the figure with his guard up, ready to fight. Meanwhile, deep in the magical forest, Leo was trying to save his legs from being severed by his tiny highness, Prince Philip who thought chopping them off would be the perfect remedy for his chancellor's inability to keep them elevated. He tried his luck with the magical forest, kindly asking it for help. Leo spoke to the forest, and the forest listened, so it turned him into a mushroom, a conscious one. The little prince placed him in his pocket and took off. The story shifts to Castiel and royal frog packs who are gliding through the air. In front of them, two towers shielded a large canyon and beyond awaited the end of the world. Being so close to their goal, Castiel kissed Pax, hoping he would grow back to his original form. When nothing happened, the frog tried to grow a scarlet mohawk and turned their eyes red their resemblance to Genevieve almost uncanny, hoping it would be sufficient incentive for Castiel. <laughs> Don't tell her I said that. With the romantic moment over, our protagonists drew closer to the towers. They glanced at the menacing turrets, noticing a shadowy figure in a balcony staring right back at them. All they could make out were its wild, hazy features that looked like Jen. Just then, Prince Emmerich pushed right past them, flying with incredible speeds towards the canyon. Pax and Castile followed. It seemed the towers were not shielding just a canyon, but a striking golden palace as well, with a tree in the middle of a garden. And in the crown of the tree, Golden apples shone brighter than the sun. Humanus landed in the garden where two hooded figures were standing close to the seemingly forbidden fruit. Genevieve got pulled out of her tapestry and immediately sensed a familiar smell coming from the mysterious figures. They revealed themselves as Lena and Monkey. Meanwhile, Pax wanted to sit on a golden apple connecting them to their quest that required sitting on the seed of knowledge. But the closer our protagonists got to the tree, the brighter the apples shone, blinding them. Suddenly, Emmerich exited the palace, picking a golden apple using a piece of stained glass and left with legend, but not before feeding the undead horse some sugar cubes. Lena and Monkey reached for a second one using a dark piece of paper. Finally, Frog Pax encountered a golden apple and proudly sat on it, but nothing happened. 
Castiel argued that they must have misunderstood the task and, surprise surprise, he was right. They were to pass judgment by bringing the seed of knowledge back into the city. So they decided to take five branches from the tree that would grow to make even more golden apples for the people to enjoy. In case you've missed Leo, he was still bouncing in Prince Philip's pocket. Now, let's see what Shaklashak is up to next. As Shaklashak drew closer, the thin man with an intense stare spoke at once. Hurrying up somewhere? Baffled by the striking accent of the entity, he cast a spell that let him see right through his foe. The amount of organs it had was abnormal to say the least, and all of them were covered in scales. The stranger called out his name, Dio, as he smiled menacingly. Dio seemed to have plans for Shaq, forcing him to assist on a mission. Just then, your Mungander appeared in Shaq's line of sight with a simple message. Run. Shaq knew right away he was in grave danger, but he might have figured that out a bit too late. Back in the garden of the Golden Palace, our protagonists were preparing to leave with their five branches from the enchanted tree. Underneath them, the Sabbath River got crowded with boats carrying corpses that headed towards the bronze statue of the fabled ferryman. Its rusty look dictated the aeons it had spent in that very place unmoved. Next to the statue, Lena and Monkey were waiting to hop on two other boats floating past the ferryman along the Sabbath waters. Oh, so that's how they teleport back to the city. Hmm, clever. Don't you see? They would use the boats to go down the river until meeting Karen and would jump before the boat got teleported and... Oh, um, still don't get it. Hmm, never mind. Let's get on with the story. Left behind after Lena switched places with two other Sabbath boats, right next to the statue were two cloaked figures. Blaze and an invisible being that also changed places with the Sabbath ferryman. Back in the skies, Jen was thrilled to learn of a wild-like creature seen in one of the Twin Towers. She was sure it was her grandmother, so she asked her companions for some time to investigate. They all agreed to give Jen two minutes. Roaming the tower under all the old rubbish and cobwebs, she found a lone strand of scarlet hair in a coffin. But in her haste to live with the others, she could only leave behind a note for the person that may still be there. As they left the towers, Blaze called out from the ground to the flying horse, asking for a spot on their back so he could leave the place with them, but Castiel answered with some ration offerings. As they flew towards the city, a gust of wind hit them. Prince Philip had just passed them, going towards the canyon. Leo was finally turned back to normal after he was sprinkled with some water. So the Chancellor and the young Prince Philip reached the garden of the Golden Palace. Blinded, Leo raced Prince Philip and the prince grabbed the last golden apple. But that did not satisfy the young prince. They had to destroy the tree. And so they started to chop it with their small swords until the prince was happy. Eventually, they hopped on Stella, their reliable pony, and bolted away with the last golden apple. Back on humanness, the Pegasus flew over a colossal mountain that was in the crew's path. At the base of it, the magical forest menacingly stood in their path, so they decided to play it safe and take a detour around it. After a long trip, they could see the city rise over the horizon line as the sun was setting, 
turning the bright day into dusk. Meanwhile, in the magical forest, Shaq was holding on to his life. He had escaped Dio, but the encounter left him constantly looking over his shoulder. Even Prince Finian passing by him was enough to knock Shaq to the ground. The beast folk decided to head back to the gates of the city, trying to reach a specific set of friendly guards. But he only encountered a bunch of well-armed defenders and catapults. Shaq dodged boulders the best he could, trying to escape the attack. Badly wounded, he even tried to reason with two guards at a catapult, but they responded with violence, stabbing him. So Shaq used the attacker as a shield against the big boulders, trying to progress through the forest. Prince Philip had reached the forest as well. The Chancellor then plead for a short rest, his energy depleting further and further. It was as if the forest had read his mind, because Leo got turned into a mushroom once more. Philip placed Leo in his pocket continuing their journey towards the city. Every party was aiming for the Sabbath chapel, where Lady Cora was holding a speech in front of the townsfolk. As Castiel roughly landed Humanus in the plaza, they could hear the crowd chanting, Lady Cora and King Evander, right after the praises from the lady herself. However, the people were baffled to find out that their king was currently a frog. The townsfolk laughed until the frog started to share the knowledge found at the end of the world. While the celebration started inside the town, outside of it, near the gates, lay a wounded Shackle Shack, still tied to one of the guards that tried to kill him. He tried to get information out of him but to no avail. So he marked him and left him behind, continuing towards the gates. However, guards kept him from entering, being nice enough to grant him a chair while he waited for someone to help him out. Just then, Prince Philip arrived with the Chancellor. The young royalty ventured into the city, while Leo stayed behind, hoping he could aid the beat down beast folk. But greed took over Shaq as he bargained for the very documents Leo swore to deliver to Pax only. Shaq had no choice but to enter the town with Leo with no documents or identification whatsoever. Meanwhile, Castile and Frog Pax were proudly holding four branches from the tree with golden apples. One branch was taken by Castile, claiming to the concerned Pax that he needed at least one branch for experiments. They agreed not to make this a secret and to use the branches in the public's favor. Genevieve got pulled out of the tapestry, staying by Humanus at the finish line. Having almost everything working well for them, there was still a problem left to deal with how to turn Frog Pax back to King Evander. Only a kiss could break the curse, but like they learned last time, it can't be any kind of kiss. It has to come from someone who truly loved Pax, and the king knew to contact Grace. Once she met up with them in the crowded plaza, she looked surprised but agreed to help. They were getting ready for the kiss when Lady Cora intervened. The lady kissed the frog, but nothing happened. She stormed out, mocking Castiel on the way. Grace leaned in, shapeshifting into a frog, and kissed Pax, turning him back to normal. As the dusk started to set in, they were all waiting for one more contestant in the trials, Prince Philip. Soon enough, Stella's hooves broke the silence in the distance and Prince Philip arrived, followed by Chancellor Leo soon after. The contestants stood before the Habdomads, awaiting trial. 
all presented their findings and their plans to use them, one after the other. Prince Finian's despicable actions of stealing from Venoris angered the Hebdomads, who chopped his head off on the spot. What caught their attention was Lina and her belief that would serve the city well. Unfortunately, she had arrived too late to the proclamation ceremony, so she had to be disqualified. Prince Emmerich satisfied the Habdomads by giving his golden apple to a poor man. He was deemed worthy. And finally, the Habdomads were pleased to hear King Evander's pledge. He presented knowledge as a priceless thing that should be accessible to all. It is to be grown, he said as the Habdomads listened. He was immediately deemed worthy, but the Habdomads had one request, to hand over the fifth branch. Evander glanced at Castiel and Castiel handed it over calmly. But Evander had a request of his own, for the Habdomads to do right by Lena and give her the credits she deserved. And they listened. As for Prince Philip, he was deemed worthy as well, joining the other parties. Only four parties remained, and only one prince perished. Now they all prepare for the next trials, this time curated by Jovis. This was the recap for episode 12 of Vim, as told by the Book of Recollections. I'm Count Bear, your recap narrator. If you'd like to follow our Dungeons and Dragons campaign, Vim, the Tale of Immortality, tune in Sundays at 5 UTC on youtube.com slash at Dysylvania. New recaps drop every Friday evening. Thanks for sticking with us, and remember, every subscribe keeps the magic going. Good day, good night, and don't let the vampire bite!